Come on, let me know when to start. Good evening to all of you. Uh, we'll start in a couple of minutes. Thank you. A very good evening to all of you. Uh, sorry for the slight delay in starting the session. Uh, today we have got a very important topic, which is handling revenue authorities. Uh, as we all know, with the on with the introduction of GST, uh, the our requirement to registration under GST has also increased, especially for service provide service sector clients. You know, on, uh, under service tax, we are a centralized registration concept. Under GST, now we are required to obtain each uh, registration in each state from where we operate, and therefore, uh, the, as the number of registrations increases, so does the need to interact with tax authorities, with the revenue authorities, also increase. Uh, in today's session, what we are going to discuss or what we are going to touch upon is what all are the touch points which we have to, uh, touch points where we are required to deal with tax authorities. What are the situations in which or in what all scenarios can there come a situation where we require, where we need to talk, interact with the revenue authorities and more importantly, uh, how do we interact with them? Because there, because uh, there are uh, certain protocols which needs to be followed when we are dealing with tax authorities, and that is what we are going to try to cover today. Uh, we'll try to keep this session, uh, uh, you know, less technical and more of you know, like a practical uh, application from the perspective of, from uh, quite a practical uh, discussion. Uh, any point of time you have any queries, just raise your hand. We will unmute you and we can have a discussion. If you have a query, you can also put it in the chat box. We will take it up. Uh, so let us first go through what all can be the touch points. There is a time when we might need to uh, you know, deal or interact with the tax officer. Uh, they can be broadly categorized into these baskets. Provisional assessments, scrutiny of returns, an assessment which the department does for you, an audit by tax authority, special audit, inspection search and seizure, and inspection of goods in movement. These are the, some of the key uh, moments or key of instances when there will be need for you to have an interaction with the tax authorities. Now, it is important to understand the concept behind these particular provisions. You know, when the law specifically says that, you know, there is a need for you to interact with the revenue authorities. We need to understand in what scenario that need comes or in what scenario uh, the uh, event you or you requiring to go to the tax authorities might come up. Let us go one by one. The first instance is a provisional assessment. Now, the concept of provisional assessment is not new. It was there in the service tax. It was there in the center of excise. What is this concept? So this mainly says that, you know, at times a tax officer might find it difficult to determine the value of goods or services he's supplying or what is the correct rate of tax. He's unable to identify. And therefore, he will go and apply to his tax officer saying that allow me to supply these goods or services on a provisional basis. Meaning, let's say I have entered into a contract with a client, but I don't know on what value I'm required to pay tax. Because there are extent valuation rules which have been prescribed, uh, taxpayer is required to follow them, or I'm unable to determine the value, the rate, applicable rate for my product. Let's say e, e two wheelers, e vehicle. There's a classification issue of whether they attract 5% or 18% GST rate. And so I'm unable to determine if I'm required to pay 18% GST on sale of vehicles or 5%. In that case, I can go to my proper officer, my jurisdiction officer. I can apply to him that, sir, please allow me to pay tax provisionally. Now, when I do that, when I prepare or when I file an application to pay tax provisionally, the proper officer has to allow that request within 90 days of I having made the application. And within six months of my application, the assessment order has to be passed, 
wherein he will determine what is the correct value of the goods or services which i am supplying or what is the correct rate of tax which is applicable please note you can apply for provision assessment in only these two scenarios and you cannot go for provision assessment in a scenario like let's say uh, i am not able to determine the correct place of supply i cannot go for that particular question it can, i cannot go to go for a provision assessment so provision assessment is only for two specific topics one where is a valuation issue or you are not able to determine the correct rate which is applicable to your supply now there can be situation that under the provision assessment let's say you ascertain that your liability to pay tax comes to rupees 100 and as per the final assessment order it turns out to be 80 rupees let's take scenario 1 that the final assessment order says that your liability is less than what you actually paid provisionally in that scenario you will be entitled to claim refund of rupees 20 and when i say you are entitled to claim refund again there is one more touch point because when you file a refund claim you have to go to the department separately there is a refund application in rfd 01 so that that is one point we have to bear in mind second scenario let's say i have paid 100 but the assessment order says that it is only 50 150 rupees in that case i have to pay rupees 50 along with interest to the government okay so this is one aspect of course provision assessment we have seen especially at least in service tax it has been quite a theoretical topic and we have also has not come across many instances where an assessor would have gone for provision assessment of course under central excise and customs it was a very uh, commonly used uh, approach by various assessors Uh, if an assessment order is passed so that say and you are not happy with the order it becomes an appealable order and we can also file an appeal against that same assessment order before the appellate authority uh, for that we'll come to some come to the last to the next slide in some time where i discussed how to deal with an adversarial assessment order an assessment order or an adjudication order which is not you know uh, as per our liking and which you like to uh, like to fight or which you like to contest how to deal with that we'll go to in some time So this is the first touch point where we are required to interact with uh, tax pay, uh, with the tax authorities. The second instance which comes is the scrutiny of returns. Uh, this is something which is uh, which is uh, very common in GST. If you are registered in the states of, let's say, Maharashtra, Karnataka, UP, they have uh, many such notices are coming. Some states have automated the issuance of these notices. Uh, you know where they just take the figures which were mentioned in GST R one or GST R three B, do a comparison and bring out an automated copy of notices. directly which comes to you by email they send bulk notices especially telangana i was a state which had done that a uh, few months back so uh, it is important that we take care of these notices we respond to this notice properly and we get the observations clearly clarified now please note this scrutiny of returns these notices are are uh, you know issued based on the returns and relevant particulars furnished by the rtp so if any issue is raised it has to be from the gstr returns which are filed by you they can be gstr 1 cb 9 90 or whatever maybe but they cannot go into some different zone and then come to you with an asmt 10 asmt 10 which is the notice issued in this uh, form under this scrutiny of return step segment it is clearly said that it is done based on the returns and relevant particulars which are furnished particulars which are furnished by you and only based on the scrutiny of them of them if any query comes you can raise a notice again it is not a more of a notice but it is more of an intimation that okay we have identified these discrepancies in the returns which have been filed by you so please give your explanation to that uh generally it is seen that you know if you give an explanation and it is found satisfactory they will draw up the proceedings if it is not found satisfactory the proper officer can either take select your case for an audit a special audit and something like that or he can just go on and issue in initial proceedings under section 73 or section 74 against you so proceedings under section 73 or 74 primary limits issuance of show cause notice for recovery of tax will come to that in some time now friends when we say scrutiny of notices returns and uh, as i said there are many notices which are coming to tax payers uh, let us try to look at some of the common notices which are very regular uh, of late we have seen since almost last two years these notices are very common uh, you know notice in the form of gstr1 versus gstr3b mismatch there are times when we have filed uh, you know return in gstr1 showing it an error of 100 rupees but our gstr3b is showing it an error of let's say 190 or only 90 rupees so the department immediately starts uh, you know noticing that you have shown less than over in gstr3b which means you have paid less tax so this is a discrepancy kindly explain see and that time when we end up uh, start explaining we have seen cases you know where clients say that uh, no 90 rupees 
why it is 90 rupees sometimes they say that humne galti se itc reverse of dikha diya output tax mein add karne ki jagah pe or something like that but whatever with the fact please verify the facts at the first stage only please note this is the starting point of our litigation generally as i said uh, you know this notice is you have to explain it satisfactorily to the proper officer and we know how difficult it is to explain them you no know, to help them understand those things and this notice is generally reserved in a situation where uh, a 73 or section 74 proceedings are initiated initiated against a taxable person so we can say that these notices which are coming to us is actually the founding stone of a long pending litigation so long impending litigation therefore it's important that our groundwork is very strong so let's say if there's a gsr1 versus gsr3 notice which has come to us we should be very clearly and categorically able to identify why there is a difference and be able to in a position to explain that and see when i say this why it has to be something which is factually correct it should not happen that at the first stage we give a reply a and then while uh, when the next notice comes our stand changes and say that no 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 the reason the 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 reason for this difference is something completely different that is an incorrect approach to handle the litigation you know that because that will also have an impact on how the officers trust you they will say that what is your trust for dinas if you keep on changing your own replies so when we receive this first notice make sure that we have the correct reason for this difference identified same applies we have seen many clients who are receiving gstr1 tds tds returns now many clients when they supply to government clients or you know when they supply to through e-commerce operators there's a tds or tcs provision applicability on them and they are required to claim the tds or tcs credit at times it might happen that in a particular month the tds uh, credit is showing higher amount as compared to what your disposed in a gstr1 or gstr3b that is because of a timing difference nothing else it is only case that we have short paid tax but based on these observations we have seen clients receiving notice saying that your t you have claimed tds of rupees let's say 10 lakhs and that is one person which will be around 10000 but your gstr3b shows a taxable turnover of only 8 lakh rupees so there's a difference of 2 lakhs please pay the differential tax now this is not something which you are required to pay but when we do that we need to be able to identify the reasons for this mismatch it will be possible that the, the vendor or your clients may have filed a late tds return may have detected late, late tds or you might have claimed late and therefore there might be this timing difference so that identification is required preparation from base and uh, proper submission is important that we respond to these notices same way a very common notice which of late we have seen is a third balance third uh, notice which is gstr 3b versus gstr 2a to be notice i am sure 90% of ssc have received this kind of notices and in many cases now the matter is now going to appeal stage also meaning after asmb time they have been issued a show cause notice and a, an order against which an appeal is filed please note please uh, you know our advice is that don't prepare a summary reconciliation wherever possible do a transaction level reconciliation to identify the key a key pain areas key suppliers who uh, you know not filed that gst to a to b and uh, take necessary corrective actions in maharashtra we have a state circular from the department of uh, you know from the commission of state tax saying that if there is a mismatch and it is because the supplier has filed wrong gst r1 let's say has disclosed it in b2c take a certificate from him and we will allow the credit so it is important that we do a transaction level reconciliation of course macro level reconciliation is very important and when i talk about gstr 3b and 2a to b notices some uh, you know precautionary checks which are very important uh, make sure that the gstr 3b figure is showing correctly what you have claimed is only captured in the notice at times we see that you know uh, in doing copy paste the department might have taken the some other dealers gstr 3b amounts in your gstr 3b which may be wrong so it's important that we identify them at the starting point similarly many times gst to a to b figures if we are the to a to b that we download from the portal and the to a to b figures with the notice mentions uh, there's a mismatch it is important that we try to identify the reason or at least ask the officer that please give us the details of the to a to b figure which have been captured by you in your gst r notice so that whenever we are able to reconcile we can always say at times you have seen that you know to a to b which i download from my clear tax portal or my gsp is showing an x figure department notice shows a x minus something figure it is important that we identify the reason it can be for n number of reasons like say government might be ignoring cases the government to a figures might not be considering the uh, to a figures when the supplier has filed his date filed his gst on return late 
in that case we have to fight legally it's a legal ground there is no legal impediment in the law which says that i cannot claim itc if my supplier has filed their gs chairman but then identification is important if there is a mismatch the reason for that identification is very important so that you can accordingly defend you can accordingly respond to the notice please note this is very crucial same way rcm liability notices are coming if your gs chair should be showing an x figure of rcm but in your gs chair 2a the auto popular figure is showing much higher we have seen clients receiving notices we have to explain why there is a mismatch at times it may be possible that we would have already paid tax when we paid the advance to the vendor or it may be a case that the we have not booked the invoice we have not made payment to the vendor and the point of taxation has not triggered and therefore there can be a mismatch it has to be explained see what happens is when we fail to explain this generally it uh, culminates into a show cause notice it might i might be sounding a bit repetitive but it's a fact people are receiving show cause notices those show cause notices are being converted into assessment orders which starts a long litigation proceeding because you know, then we have to go to bank commissioner appeals deputy commissioner appeals or additional commissioner appeals then we have to wait for a couple of years now till the tribunal is formed and there is an intervening cost which is involved in this entire process so it is important that whenever this notice is come be properly identify we scrutinize the contents of the notice for authenticity for the correctness of the figures mentioned therein this takes me to the next set of touch point is the assessment uh, the gst law identifies assessment in three different scenarios one is the assessment of an un, for a non filer of returns if we have failed to file monthly returns or final return that is return to be filed after cancellation and we have been served with a default and notice the proper officer can do a best judgment assessment based on the records which are available with him let's give let me give a crude example uh, i have filed my gst r1 but i have not filed my gst r3 b uh i have been served a non filer notice but still i don't take any action the department can do my assessment as a non filer of return based on what i have done or i have declared in my gst r1 he can issue an assessment order that is he will not consider the itc which has been accrued to me and once that situation takes place i will have to end up now fighting filing an appeal against that assessment order before the appeal authority do a pre deposit compliance and so on so it is important that we avoid instances where we are tagged as a non filer of return many times we see that clients the department officers have basically sent notices saying that you have not filed returns please do not ignore those notices if you have filed the return at least give a one liner email saying that sir we have filed the return we are sending the acknowledgement so all those documentation is very important see, okay please note that second one is assessment of unregistered person now at times i'm sure uh, if someone would have was involved in bad practice there was a concept of uod assessment that is assessment when a person was unregistered some similar, similar concept is continuing under gst with slight variations here they have said that where there is a failure to obtain registration even though a person is liable to do so or where a person's registration was cancelled but he is still liable to pay tax let's take an example of so motor cancellation of registration by the department but the liability to pay tax continues you are required to pay tax on your supplies which are making after the registration is cancelled in those cases also there is a provision for best judgment assessment your returns you will be assessed to tax on best judgment assessment and you are like that again you have to file an appeal against that order it is not a cancelable order you can obviously go for rectification but it's difficult to get an order rectified from the tax authorities so this is the second type of assessment third assessment is summary assessment uh here see when we discussed two more for two previous forms of assessment which were uh, assessment of an unregistered person and assessment of a non filer of return in in the, both of those cases you don't require to obtain a prior approval of your superior authority the proper officer does not need to take approval from his joint commissioner or assistant deputy commissioner but in when you do an a summary assessment you require a prior approval of the joint or the additional commissioner there has to be an evidence showing that a tax liability of the person is there but he has not paid it and there is a need to safeguard the revenue interest only in those cases you can issue a summary assessment order merely because a person has not filed return as filed return but has not paid the tax for example let's say has filed gst r1 but not paid gst r3 b due to financial issues that may not be sufficient case for summary assessment it might go into assessment for non filer of returns but if there's some case let's say has made supplies but is not filing any returns only and there's a chance that i might run away in that case a summary assessment can be done done and when the assessment order is done i have to go and file an appeal but if there are order is erroneous so there is some grave mistake in that order the additional joint commissioner can withdraw it within 30 days and initiate proceedings for recovery under section 70 or 74 as may be appropriate meaning that say that some amount mismatch or some, something is wrong 
or there is no need for doing a summary assessment order on me in that case the joint or registration commissioner may by an order withdraw it and then he may direct the proper officer that you initiate proceedings under section 70 or 74 sir appropriate and request start recovery for the correct amount okay this takes into the next which is a department audit again it's a very common uh, many of the clients have started receiving notices for department audit the state tax authorities are very active the central tax authorities are also very active uh, when we do audit department audit there is a bit of distinction between uh, the understanding the concept of audit this audit uh, you know under vat uh, regime we have a concept of assessment that will be desk audit and all whereas under service tax and central tax we had sera audit or e excise audit which is we called ea 2000 audit uh, the department audit that we are talking about is more of a more uh, you know as more of a uh, we carry forward of the ea 2000 audit regime under the service tax and central tax regime uh, here the concept is that the audit team visits your office or is required to visit office of your office and uh, you know conduct the audit so the central audit, audit team we see they come and uh, religiously do audit at your own site at the dealer's place of business state tax are bit continuing with the old scheme of things they do visit for one day of the audit which is a starting day and then they call the officers or they call the assessor to come with the files to their office at masga or belapur whatever it may be and get the audit done there's a bit of distinction bit of different approach which both the departments follow uh, the general notice uh, rule is that you know once a notice is if you decide that your client is, is to be audited or if i am as an officer if i want to do an audit i cannot do it this uh, as such i have to receive an order from my superior officer either my the name of the dealer should be included in a general order or a specific order that okay the accounts of this ssc this ssc needs to be audited under the this section sorry and once the my name is selected in the audit list once it is decided that decided that my accounts are to be audited i will be given at least 15 days notice in form ad01 saying that okay boss your name has been selected in the audit aapka naam water mein aa gaya hai and we will be coming to your premises to start the audit within 15 days there has to be minimum notice of 15 days a notice will also give the contents of the audit what all uh, documents they require for carrying out the audit and generally you are expected to keep those details ready at times they might also request that before doing the before they start the audit the basic documents are submitted to them now when we say this basic documents at times it, it is also seen that you know the audit team asks us to prepare some questionnaires some data uh, please be very careful when filling those data please go through those data also because at times the wordings are a bit sketchy there they you ask for some ratio analysis and analysis and all please be very careful don't submit it without checking if possible try to get it reviewed by us or your consultants as me the case may be and uh, make sure that you fill proper data because once nowadays a lot of this data goes electronically and once the data is gone it is difficult to withdraw it right so there is one aspect second point which we all need to bear in mind is that an audit has to be completed within the 3 months from the date of commencement this is provided in the statute so uh, of course it is not very uh, religiously followed by officers and even we as tax payers don't object to it because we don't know, don't want to get into the bad books of the tax payer, uh, tax authorities but this is one aspect which you can keep in mind if an audit gets keeps on getting prolonged and uh, you know it it be, becomes rather than an rather than an audit it becomes sorry sort of an harassment it is always a tool which is available with us we can always argue that the audit is now no has to be completed it is more than 3 months since start of commencement once an audit is coming to a conclusion the audit team is expected to give you a, give you a report containing the findings rights and obligations of the registered person within 30 days uh, the central excise audit team gives you a final audit report far which is now a cgst team the state gst teams i have not had come across any formal audit report from them upon completion but i'm sure they will also be issuing uh, between this process between the completion of the before the completion of the audit generally and issuance of the final audit report generally we have seen that the audit team also issues a observation para observation letter means what all points they have observed and they would ask you to pay it off that you know so that you get a clean audit report uh, many times we see uh, some very large amounts being involved as a pressure i think tactic by the audit teams that you know so that or a intimidation tactic 
it is advisable that to not get intimidated so easily uh, review the contents of the para and give a proper legal response stating why these amounts are not payable uh, especially when the notice asks you to pay interest or late fee or any some dues on account of let's say gstr1 versus 3b mismatch liability excess short reporting please go back to your own records it may be possible that when you are filing annual return you would have paid that amount of tax it should not happen that you end up paying the same amount again so make sure that you keep check on that part also uh, based on your observation para the final audit report is prepared as i told you within 30 days of completion of audit and if you do not accept with any audit para generally the audit committee of the department will uh, advise or you know will direct for issuance of show cause notice that is initiation of recovery proceedings under section 73 or 74 okay so this is department audit now when i say department audit uh, most of us are facing this issue uh, or are uh, most of you as tax payers are also getting your accounts audited audited by the tax authorities right now uh, if we have any specific query related to thing to department audit i would request you to raise your hand we can uh, unmute you or you can put your queries in chat chat if it, if there are any queries we will take it up otherwise we will proceed ahead with the next slide anyone okay we will go ahead this takes me to the next type of audit which is special audit again uh, a special audit is a common pr uh, principle which was there under the central excess and vat also here there is an audit which is done by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant but at the cost and expense of the department so at times the department or your assessing officer might feel that you have not correctly declared well, uh, value of service or value of supply or i have claimed excess credit then what i what you are entitled to in that case the officer who is not going below the rank of an assistant commissioner he will direct that the register person to get his accounts audited by an auditor who is appointed by the state government by the department not state government it can be central government also that audit will have to be completed within 90 days and all the expense of the audit will be borne by the department it is not a case that the auditor will come at your place and say that okay now you pay me 50000 rupees for this audit no the auditor is appointed by the department and so the expense of this audit will also be borne by the department and uh, based on the findings of this audit uh, the department will initiate recovery proceedings against you that is they will issue show cause notice under section 73 or 74 for recovery of the amount based on the disputes again a uh, special audit is a concept we have not seen many cases where clients where department would recommend a special audit on a clients generally the our accounting records are accepted by them it is in very rare cases we have seen that it goes a different zone this takes me to the next slide or the next topic for today which is the inspection search and seizure this is the one which gives you know a goosebumps to tax payers uh, in simple words if we say this is what we call a raid proceedings against us uh the department just like vat and service tax even gst there are provisions for carrying out inspection search and seizure of a place of business of a registered person and its related entities uh that can be done of course with a prior authorization by an additional or joint commissioner by an officer who is not below the rank of joint commissioner so either the joint commissioner or his superior authority has to give an authorization in writing that authorization has to be given only on the basis of reasons to believe that a particular taxable person has suppressed any transaction relating to supply or he has suppressed his stock let's say uh, the department believes that i am selling a lot of items in cash so he, the department would believe that if i am if on a particular date i am saying that i have stock worth of this 1 crore my actual stock in hand is 30 lakh rupees so they should have reasons to believe that there such a circumstance exist or they believe that i have taken excess input tax credit then what i am entitled to or i have indulged in any contravention of the any of the provisions of the sector rules they can come and visit my premises they can inspect they can search they can carry out a search at my premises and they can seize my goods my books of accounts and any other documents which they feel are relevant to the to that proceedings now when that happens they can search my document they can seize my documents please note they can also take those documents with them at their place of business at their offices till the time the investigation proceedings continue but they are bound to return those books within 30 days and even during this 30 days let's say they do it in september month they come to your office on 10th of september and you have to file your itr by 30 september you have a right to go and ask from them that okay i want the copies of these documents because i want to file my it returns my balance sheets with the tax income tax department and they will generally give that permission to you uh 
in any case they have to return the goods within 30 days to you uh goods if any are seized from you they also have to be released at the most within 6 months from the date of seizure a uh, many cases where we have seen that these uh, proceedings are initiated by the department are cases where i do not have a lot of liability payment in cash meaning let's say i am a noted duty structure entity meaning that all my rate of inputs on input rate of tax on input is higher than rate of tax on outputs which results in you know accumulation of credit ledger balance or i am an exporter predominantly the exporter so i don't uh, the need to pay tax on output uh, supplies is very less everything is paid using credit ledger balance in those cases they can visit your premises and we have seen uh, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, news a lot of articles in news recently that you know many of the times there was harassment which is done to taxpayers there is an intimidation or pressurizing tactics to make the tax authority to make the taxpayers make payment of taxes uh, please note you can always object to that and uh, you know abstain from making payment if you feel that there is no requirement legally to make the payment of tax they cannot force you to do that at times you have heard news that they themselves log into your account and fill the drc 0 and make you uh, file the form which is a form for payment of tax you can always object to such an action by the department of finance in any case those payments are all uh, payments under protest if you are forced to make or if you make some payment make sure that you give them an intimation in writing that i have made so much of payment to post the inspection or during the inspection and <coughs> and mention that this payment is not towards any admitted dues but rather it is a payment which i am making under protest i intend to claim a refund of this and this is refundable there are many judgments from the high courts even in, even in the context of gst but the courts have directed that you have to refer this amount you cannot just say that no i will take the money and the deposit also or under as a protest and then i will just not adjudicate the matter there is a time limit reserve time limit has to be followed to close the matters generally we have also seen that these proceedings also result in so ultimately into uh issuance of notice under section 73 or 74 that is show cause notice proceedings there is some uh controversy as to who will adjudicate this show cause notice is but i am sure it's not but uh, i feel it's not relevant for today's uh, forum so we'll not go into that zone the last point from my today's discussion is is, is that uh, or, uh, relating to touch points with tax authorities is the topic of inspection of goods when they are in movement uh, you will find that this topic is also covered in the next session so i just quickly take explain what i want to say here uh we all know that when whenever there is any movement of goods taking place there needs to be an underlying uh, the person who is, who is in charge of the vehicle in which the goods are being transported he should be in possession of the specified documents which generally are a copy of tax invoice the transporter's copy of tax invoice the associated eva bill which would have been prepared and the delivery chalan if your client is if you are also required to do e invoicing it is advisable that invoicing documents are incorporated in a tax invoice or that copy is carried accompanied along with him we see we find that you know when there is this documents are not there there are contraventions alleged by the proper officer who is stationed at the check, border check post of which state and then he will say that okay i am going to confiscate your goods i am going to detain your goods in this case if that if you enter into that situation that there is some mismatch let's say we have seen cases uh, the invoice was invoice number was one and in your eva bill you mentioned invoice number 2 by error or let's say the quantity there is some mismatch or <coughs> the truck is found at a location which is not en route to, to reach the destination finally and based on this kind of trivial cases they have said that okay this is a contravention and i will detain the goods i will confiscate the goods in those cases they have to issue a notice within 7 days of detention they have to pass an order and upon passing the order you have to pay a penalty which is uh, 200 times of tax charged on the invoice or uh, i think it's 25% of the value of goods or 25000 which are is higher which are is lower uh, in case of exempted goods so that is one aspect which you have keep it need to keep in mind we are, we'll be covering this again in the next session by my partner cash parma that at that time we will be covering it in more detail uh, one more touch point for uh, with revenue authorities which i have not covered in this slide is the in case of filing of refund applications uh even in case of refund applications there are while the law does not require to be there any touch point officially we find that many times there there are a lot of requirements to visit the tax authorities to explain that the claims 
uh, in some states there is a concept of physical verification of a place of business before they actually come uh, sanction the refund claim so that is one more point which we also bear in mind if we are intending to file a refund claim uh, all our other documents of our directors and authorized entities should be updated or bank account details should be updated updated this this one point which we need to keep in mind relating to refunds uh, all these touch points which you discussed uh, you know re, from provisional assessment till uh, inspection such as these ultimately the conclusion the outcome of that proceedings is that there will be a notice issued to us in sec, under section 73 or 74 which is in simple terms said a show cause notice meant for recovery of any tax which is not paid or short paid or an input tax credit which is wrongly availed and utilized or an a refund which has been erroneously refunded to granted sanctioned to us these are the circumstances for which a notice under section 73 or 74 can be issued and therefore whenever we receive a notice under section 73 or section 74 the first thing we need to do is we have to identify what are the issues the issues can be multiple because uh, you know state authorities have a simple have a policy where they have a approach where they cover all the points in one show notice whereas central tax authorities have approach of uh, doing issuing a show notice visa visa issue meaning if there are three issue, different issues in your audit they will issue three different show notice whereas the state government will issue only one show notice so when there is one show notice we have to understand the issue and we are, we should do a, a quantification of demand visa vis the issue it is very important it should not happen that we just give legal response but the quantification and then is incorrect and then when we go to appeal stage and we identify come to this point we might be a bit late because you no know, appeal authority the tribunal will not entertain those request in very easily so the first point when we get a notice is to understand the issue involved and verifying whether the the correctness of the thing if they have said that your gst has been and gst to a figure is there's a mismatch make sure that the gst has been figures which they have referred to in the notice or the gst to a figures which they are referring in the notice are correct there should not be any incorrectness or, or variations and if the notice says that okay we have relied upon this documents while issuing the show cause notice if the department says so make sure that the relied upon documents are available with us if not write a specific letter to them that sir we have been served with this show cause notice saying wherein these documents have been said to have been relied upon but the documents are not provided to us we request you to kindly provide us a copy of those documents one more point which we need to notice is it each notice has to be speaking notice when i say speaking notice what the department try intends to carry it to bring it forward it should be clearly coming out in the show cause notice it is very important because only if we are able to comprehend what the department is trying to say what the case what is the case that the department is trying to make against us only in that scenario will we be able to properly reply to that notice so it is always be always necessary and always important for us that we receive a notice which is a speaking notice these were some of the legal aspects which we have to deal with while reading a notice we also to make sure that there are some procedural requirements which are complied with first one is whether the correct provisions are invoked like i said there are two different provisions under which a show cause notice can be issued one is a notice under section 73 and second is a notice under section 74 the department cannot invoke both the provisions a notice cannot be issued under section 73 and 74 or a section 73 read with 74 it can it has to be only section 73 or only section 74 what is the difference the so section 73 is a notice which is, which is issued for recovery of dues in the normal period of limitation meaning the law law says that okay for up to 3 years you if you want to do any recovery it has to be under section 73 but if you want to do recovery after 3 years have lapsed you can do under section 74 provided there is an element of fraud or suppression or willful misstatement with an intention to evade payment of tax see these are grave charges in any case where someone says that you know you have committed a fraud or you have suppressed some facts these are grave charges and the department has to demonstrate that whether how this is a case involving fraud or willful misstatement or suppression of facts so it is important that we look at it that way that you know the correct provisions are invoked the notices issued within proper time if the if let's say uh, the notice is issued under section 73 but after a time of 4 years then it is clear the time bar the notice cannot be issued under section 73 the department should have invoked section 74 the department should have shown that yes there is a case of fraud or suppression or willful misstatement with an intention to evade payment of tax only then such notice is valid so we have to understand those points we have to identify this particular 
uh, no elements which are required for a valid notice and that this will help us to prepare a mindset or a framework of how do we respond to this notice one more point which we should bear in mind or which we should which we should check without fail is that whether the notice has been issued in proper format or in proper mode because the uh, gst law a lot of things are supposed to be online so whether the notice has been issued online or manually now a best example i will give you is that in maharashtra itself you have seen that by the state government officials state tax officials are issuing all the notices for in online mode the central government notices are coming in and for manual mode it is possible that today if when we receive those notices and we object to those manual notices a few years down the line if the supreme court says that all those notices which are issued in manually are invalid in that case even if there uh, we can always genuinely we can get a genuine benefit from the government from the courts saying that you know because our notice was also issued manually we have objected to that our notice is also liable to be dismissed dropped and that's a benefit and you will get that benefit only if you have looked into this aspect of whether it is issued in proper format or not after reading the notice comes the next step of replying to the notice which is the most important merely we doing this set of exercise and we not doing this would not will not serve any purpose replying to notice is quantity essential is the most essential activity and properly replying is the is even more important therefore we generally advise that you know uh, when a notice comes and i'm sure you would have seen that if you would have replied for a notice for you there is a proper framework a structure in which all the notices are being replied uh, generally the first part of a reply to notice is notice is the summary of notice meaning it would cover to whom are we responding to and what is the overall demand which the show cause notice intends to recover from us and a, a basic uh, preamble to a reply to show cause notice a basic juncture saying saying denial of the amounts which are sought to be recovered from us second comes the background facts a brief background facts about the notice what we do where we are registered how this entire proceedings have initiated a brief a very brief uh, write up can be given about it it is always important because when we go into appeal the tribunals and the high, high court will do look at all those documentations uh, third is which is very common in income tax till now we have seen but was not regularly done in service tax or gst and vat is giving a, a write up or you know of event which led to the issuance of current notice meaning that say i was issued an asmd 10 i replied to it the department did not find my explanation satisfactorily so now i am was served with the drc 01a i again replied to it and then i was served with the shogos notice okay uh, what is drc 01a just a small uh, point i will just explain it uh, after before a notice is to be issued to me under section 73 or 74 the department will give me an opportunity of you know uh, opportunity whereby they will intimate that okay we have ascertained that this tax is a tax interest and penalty which is required to be paid by you these are the reasons you please pay if you agree accept with this if you don't accept you give us some reasons why it is not to be payable and based on our reply the drc01 will be determined if the department is convinced by my reply at this stage they get they might not issue the drc01 show cause notice and if they are not convinced they will issue generally the second part they are never convinced by our submission and they generally issue drc01 uh then we comes the next part is understanding the allegations made in the notice and once we understand the allegations which are made in the notice we have to respond to each and every allegation irrespective of whether it's for a small amount as small as 10000 rupees also many times we see that you know uh, routine notice, routine points like the area of penalty they are not responded to it is important that whatever is sought to be demanded whatever is an allegation in a show cause notice there has to be each and a rebuttal for each and every allegation this is because when we go to appeal when we go to tribunal or high court we don't know which particular reply will come to our aid in further defending our case so this is one aspect which you all should bear in mind uh an extra to reply many times we refer we refer to various documents in support of our uh, reply to show cause notice it is always important that we maintain those documentations we supplement those documents with the reply to show cause notice let's say it's a gst or cb versus 2a case and we see that my 3b claim is x whereas the notice says y why it is x give a copy of gst or cb to with the notice and always preferable is a portal cb copy so that you know we have justified our claim we have said that our claim only x rupees of itc then my documentation will show the same so make sure that is one point which we have all the documents which you are referring to should be a part of our reply to show cause notice as an exhibit as an annexure uh, lastly 
replied to the show course only like i said it has to be done properly it has to be submitted many times we see that you know we prepare the replies of show course and send to clients and clients just sleeps over it they don't reply to show course notice avoid those situations each notice has to be replied with in the prescribed time if you are not able to reply you should apply for an extension and when you apply for an extension and do it online make sure that you also send it via email to the officer or you go and meet the officer and discuss with him that sir we require some more time to reply to the notice each notice the reply to the notice has to be filed online physical submission may not be accepted just like we are objecting to a manual show cause notice or a notice which is not in proper form the department will also object to the reply if we don't do it in the proper format so make sure that we reply to the show cause notice online of course this is possible only when we receive a notice man online if you have received a manual notice a reply will also to go manually because the notice is not there in the system we cannot reply to it in the system once we reply to the show cause notice generally the next step is that we get a personal hearing before the adjudicating authority so at the adjudicating authority of course we will reiterate the submissions that we have already made we will also submit the copy of case laws which we rely on rely upon for our case with your detailed working to supporting you no know, which we have already referred to in our reply to show cause notice all those documentations we have to reiterate a short synopsis of the matter is to be given make sure that your uh, personal hearing is recorded there's a proceeding sheet maintained by the officer you sign on it properly verify the contents and if you commit that okay i will give you this additional information make sure that you give it in time after this the last step is very important please follow up for order as at times it might happen that you know after the hearing is done the officer passes the order but he sends it to a wrong address or he sends it to one of our old address the order comes back from the office and then you sleep over it we feel that the order is not passed we are losing precious time and we will be just surprised one day when department starts recovery proceeding saying that against this show cause notice an order has been passed and you have not filed an appeal so i'm recovering the entire amount assuming that you have accepted the demand and then you have to start on a fire fighting basis to you no know, file an appeal first of all obtain the order file an appeal get an interim stay and so on so please make sure that you follow up for order with your officers and make sure that you know an order does not go unnoticed now when order comes there can be two scenarios obviously or we can say there can be three scenarios one is that the order is favorable means whatever demand was sought to be recovered from us is accept is uh, dropped by the department department agrees with our submissions which is again uh, a, a desirable situation for us second situation we find is the department does not agree and just confirms the demand which is proposed in the show cause notice this is a worst case scenario worst case scenario and the okay okay scenario would be case where part demand is accepted and part demand is dropped so there can be three three scenarios for an order uh, we will talk about how to deal with an adversarial order means an order which is not in our favor it can be both the two scenarios where which is entirely demand confirmed or partly demand confirmed uh, first pro process in this case is to identify who is the appropriate appeal authority where to be file an appeal now this is an issue you will file find in many state tax appeals because they, the state orders orders passed by state officers not come with a preamble saying that an appeal against this order is to be filed against so and so authority so finding an appropriate authority uh, authority or appeal authority is difficult in, in case of states central they have a practice of mentioning a preamble page the cover page of the order is generally a preamble page which contains the details of person against whom you can file an appeal and therefore it's very easy in those cases the next step is to draft an appeal now drafting an appeal is a very complex step uh, first it has to be filed online if the order in original is online if it is manual of course your appeal will also be manual Uh, the form for filing an appeal is APL zero one. This appeal will go before the appeal authorities, the first appeal authorities, which can either be your deputy commissioner appeals or joint commissioner appeals or commissioner appeals. DC appeal is a designation in the states, and JC appeal is in the state. Ah, uh, in central government, we have JC appeal or additional commissioner appeal and commissioner appeal. Now, when we file an appeal, the first step, important step, is to do a comparison. What was the allegation in the show notice? What is my submission? what is the orders reasoning to if he is rejecting my submission this three chart is very important because this will be your uh, basis to frame the grounds of appeal you should know that how this authority adjudicating authority who has passed the order and confirmed the demand on me how has he rejected my submissions on what basis he has rejected because only on the basis of that rejection order the basis of rejection will be able to draft a reply a ground of appeal either to explain how he has erred in doing so and so so it is important 
that we do a detailed analysis of the adjudication order. Now, when we draft an appeal, like I said, the first step is filing an APA 01 and online form. Then we have to prepare a statement of facts, index two and detailed graphs of appeal. And what is the relief that we intend to claim along with this uh, appeal? Last is again important is exhibit. We have to give a lot of documents that as exhibit with the appeal. Please make sure that if you are giving a reply to show cause notice. Now, many times we see that clients make this error that you know while filing reply to these exhibits, they only give the first page of the submission. So if I have submitted a 100 page reply to show cause notice, they will only give the first page as exhibit. Please do not do that mistake. Give the entire documentation as to go. There might be some pages which are printed and they might you might feel it's a waste of page pages, but it is required because you know, at, at appeal stage again, you will ask where are the documents. So you don't want the appeal hearing also to get adjourned day by day, every time. Because you know, uh, once the appeal hearing comes on one day, then the next will be after two months. This is one aspect which you should keep in mind. Uh, some doc procedural aspect about filing appeal, uh, certified copy is required. It has to be certified by the officer who has passed the order. So please get it certified, CA certified or is not accepted, acceptable or even a notarized copy is not acceptable generally. We don't want any last minute uh, challenges subsequently. Next part, pre-deposit payment. Uh, you have to pay, make a pre-deposit payment by DRC 03. Uh, but please, when you're doing in case of appeal, firstly, you have to, the pre-deposit is compulsory in cash. Even if you have credit ledger balance, please ignore that. You have to make the payment in cash only. That is a judgment from the Orissa High Court in Jyoti Construction. Please make sure that you follow that judgment and make the pre-deposit in cash. And the pre-deposit has to be compulsorily done from the appeal module. Don't go to my applications and create a new DRC-03. It has to be done from the appeal module against the order. Your DRC-03 has to be tagged to this order against which you're appealing. This is one more important aspect which you should all bear in mind. Uh, lastly, after you file the appeal online, you have to submit a physical copy to the appellate authority. Uh, the time limit available to file the appeal is 90 days from the date of receipt of order in original. And within seven days of filing the appeal, you have to submit the physical copy to the appellate authority. We have seen cases where after, though the appeal was filed in time because I did not submit within seven days to the appellate authority, my appeal was rejected. I had to go and knock the doors of high court, which would have given gave me relief. But we all know approaching high court and higher authority comes with the associated cost. So it's always better to be, to be uh, you know, uh, better to be compliant in those parts and in the smaller aspects of the law rather than be sorry. Uh, this is all from my side for today's session. I thank you all for the wonderful, uh, for, for the patient hearing. Uh, we have, okay, I have one query uh, which says not, notice from departments. One of the criteria was excess balance in cash ledger. Now, many times we see that, uh, you know, uh, what happens is that I have a balance in cash ledger. For example, like I said, I am in inverted duty structure client. I have, my output tax is 15, 18%, not 12%, but my input is at a higher rate of 18% or 28%. So I always have a balance in cash ledger, in credit ledger, or I am an exporter and I am a predominantly an exporter. Let's say my turnover is 50% export, 50% taxable. So 50% export is the payment of tax. So at times department issues a notice saying that why don't you have any cash liability? Why are you claiming excess in only you always have sufficient input tax credit balance? This needs to be explained to the officer. You have to explain your business model to the officer saying that, sir, see, for example, even in many cases, uh, I would have a situation where I, I do not have an inner duty structure. I don't have exports, but still I have balancing credit ledger. For example, I'm a stockist, I'm a wholesaler. So let's say I buy goods worth be 10 crores in one go, but that would be sold over a period of time. So I always have sufficient balance in my credit ledger available with me. So, the department will come back to me and say that boss, you have 10 crores worth of ITC, but why don't you have sufficient output tax liability? Is it that you have claimed ITC without, without claiming the, without receiving goods or service? Is this a case of fraudulent ITC? The answer is no, but the perspective has to be explained to the authorities. You have to explain them that, sir, I am an importer, I am a wholesaler. I purchase in bulk, but my sale goes in parts. So I will always have, I will not be able to, uh, I will never have a cash liability because my credit liability is sufficiently available with me. I am a stockist. So that is one reason which you can explain to the officers. Okay. Now, do we have any other queries? Okay. Uh, I thank you all for the wonderful session uh, and the support and the feedback that we received for this back-to-back uh, -back GST series. 
series i thank you all uh, we will see you again on next tuesday when my partner ca uh, yash parmar will be uh, taking on the next topic i thank you all for the opportunity